Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janavala Bhagiri Varada Jashoda Nandana Braj Janaranjana Jashoda Nandana Braj Janaranjana Jamunati Ravanacha His divine grace, Abhay, Charanar, Vindabhakti, Vedanta, 
स्वामीशल प्रभुपाद की अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की ग्रंथराज श्रीमद्भागवतम की पिता गौर प्रेमानंदे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ग्रंथाश्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो टू चैप्टर नाइन वर्स टेन प्रवर्तते यजस्तमस्त सिश्रम न काल विक्रम न यया किपरे हरे तापरे हरे अनुव्रता यसुरासुरार्चि प्रवर्तते यजस्तमस्त सिश्रम न काल विक्रम काल विक्रम न यया किपरे हरे तापरे हरे अनुव्रता यसुरासुरार्चि प्रवर्तते यजस्तमस्त सिश्रम न काल विक्रम काल विक्रम न यया किपरे हरे तापरे हरे अनुव्रता यसुरासुरार्चि परे हरे अनुता सुरासुरार्चि प्रवर्तते यजस्तमस्त सिश्रम न काल विक्रम कि 
मुता परे हरे अनुव्रता यसुरासुराचिता प्रवर्तते रजस्तमस्त सत्श्रम न काल विक्रम मया कि परे हरे अनुव्रता सत्रसुरासुराचिता प्रवर्तते प्रिवेल यत्र वेरिन रजह तमहा द मोड्स ऑफ पैशन एंड इग्नोरेंस तयो ऑफ बोथ ऑफ देम सत्व द मोड ऑफ गुडनेस च एंड मिश्रम मिक्सचर न नेवर च एंड काल टाइम विक्रम इन्फ्लुएंस सॉरी न नीदर यन माया इलूजरी एक्सटर्नल एनर्जी किम वॉट उत देर इज अपरे अदर्स हरे ऑफ द पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड अनुव्रत डिवोटीज यन सुर बाय द डेमी गॉड्स असुर एंड द डीम्स अर्चित वर्शिप्ड ट्रांसलेशन परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस इसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्री प्रभुपाद translation in that personal abode of the lord the material modes of ignorance and passion do not prevail nor is there any of their influence in goodness there is no predominance of the influence of time so what to speak of the illusory external energy it cannot enter that region without discrimination both the demigods and the demons worship the lord as devotees the kingdom of god or an atmosphere of vaikuntha nature which is called tripa the tripada vibhuti is three times bigger than the material universes and is described here as also in the bhagavad gita in the nutshell this universe containing billions of stars and planets is one of the billions of such universes clustered together within the compass of the mahat tatva and all of these millions and billions of universes combined together constitute only one fourth of the magnitude of the whole creation of the lord there is the spiritual sky also beyond the sky are the spiritual planets under the names of vaikuntha and all of them constitute three fourths of the entire creation of the lord god's creations are always innumerable even the leaves of a tree cannot be counted by a man nor can the hairs on his head however foolish men are puffed up puffed up with the idea of becoming god himself though unable to create a hair on their own of their own bodies man may discover so many wonderful vehicles of journey but even if he reaches the moon by his much advertised space craft he cannot remain there the same man therefore without being puffed up as if he were the god of the universe abides by the instructions of the vedic literature the easiest way to acquire knowledge in transcendence so let us know through the authority of shrimad bhagavatam of the nature and constitution of the transcendental world beyond the material sky in that sky the material qualities especially the modes of ignorance and passion are completely absent the mode of ignorance influences a living entity to the habit of lust and hankering and this means that in the vaikuntha lokas the living entities are free from these two things as confirmed in the bhagavad gita in the brahma bhuta stage of life one becomes free from hankering and lamentation therefore the conclusion is that the inhabitants of the vaikuntha planets are all brahma bhuta living entities as distinguished from the mundane creatures who are all compact in hankering and lamentation 
when one is not in the modes of ignorance and passion one is supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness in the material world goodness in the material world also at times becomes contaminated by touches of the modes of passion and ignorance in the vaikuntha loka it is unalloyed goodness only the whole situation there is one of freedom from the illusory manifestation of the external energy although illusory energy is also part and parcel of the supreme lord illusory energy is differentiated from the lord the illusory energy is not however false as claimed by the mon- monist philosophers the rope accepted as a snake may be an illusion to a particular person but the rope is a fact and the snake is also a fact the illusion of water on the hot desert may be illusion for the ignorant animal searching for water in the desert but the desert and water are actual facts therefore the material creation of the lord may be an illusion to the non devotee but to a devotee even the material creation of the lord is a fact as the manifestation essence of his external energy but this energy of the lord is not all the lord has his internal energy also which has another creation known to be the vaikuntha lokas where there is no ignorance no passion no illusion and no past and present with a poor fund of knowledge one may be unable to understand the existence of such things as the vaikuntha atmosphere but that does not nullify its existence that spacecraft cannot reach these planets does not mean there are no such planets for they are described in the revealed scriptures as quoted by shri jeeva goswami we can know from the narad pancharatra that the transcendental world or vaikuntha atmosphere is enriched with transcendental qualities these transcendental qualities as revealed through the devotional service of the lord are distinct from the mundane qualities of ignorance passion and goodness such qualities are not attainable by the non devotee class of men in the padma purana uttarakhand it is stated that beyond the one fourth manifestation of god's creation is the three fourths manifestation the marginal line between the material manifestation and the spiritual manifestation is the viraja river and beyond the viraja which is a transcendental current flowing from the perspiration of the body of the lord there is the three fourths manifestation of god's creation this part is eternal everlasting without deterioration and unlimited and it contains the highest perfectional stage of living conditions in the sankhya kaumudi it is stated that unalloyed goodness or transcendence is just opposite to the material modes all living entities there are eternally associated without any break and the lord is the chief and prime entity in the agama puranas also the transcendental abode is described as follows the associated members there are free to go everywhere within the creation of the world and there is no limit to such creation particularly in the region of the three fourths magnitude since the nature of that region is unlimited there is no history of such a association nor is there end of it the conclusion may be drawn that because of the complete absence of the mundane qualities of ignorance and passion there is no question of creation nor of annihilation in the material world everything is created and annihilated everything is created and everything is annihilated and the duration of life between the creation and annihilation is temporary in the transcendental realm there is no creation and no destruction and thus the duration of life is eternally unlimited eternal unlimitedly in other words everything in the transcendental world is everlasting full of knowledge and bliss without deterioration since there is no deterioration there is no past present and future in the estimation of time it is clearly stated in this verse that the influence of time is conspicuous by its absence the whole material existence is manifested by actions and reactions of elements which make the influence of time prominent in the matter of past present and future there are no such actions and reactions of causes and effects there so the cycle of birth growth existence transformations deterioration and annihilation the six material changes are not existent there it is the unalloyed manifestations of the ex, of the energy of the lord without illusion as experienced here in the material world the whole vaikuntha existence proclaims that everyone there is a follower of the lord the lord is the chief leader there without any competition for leadership and the people in general are all followers of the lord it is confirmed in the vedas therefore that the lord is the chief leader and that all and all other living beings 
entities are subordinate to him for only the lord satisfies all the needs of all other living entities ओम ज्ञानतिमरंदाजनिशलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातरिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो टुडे मॉर्निंग वी डिस्कसिंग द चैप्टर ऑफ द श्रीमद भागवतम विच इज द आंसर्स बाय ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस दैट वेर रेज्ड इन द प्रीवियस चैप्टर and here specifically the spiritual world is being described so today i'll talk about uh, understanding the spiritual world and i'll talk about three broad themes within it but before that let's look at what is this verse saying this verse gives four broad characteristics of the spiritual world one is it is free from modes न प्रवर्त यजस्तम एंड देन सत्व च मिश्रम दैट इवन इधर द अनकंटैमिनेटेड गुड अनकंटैमिनेटेड इज सो इवन गुडनेस इज देयर बट इन द अनकंटैमिनेटेड वे देन इट इज इट इज बियॉन्ड टाइम न काल विक्रम दैट द इन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ टाइम इज नॉट देयर ओवर देयर देन इट इज सेज इट इज आउटसाइड माया न माया that there is no maya over there and there and, there, and you could say these three are more of negative describers what it is not and then the last is a positive describer is everyone is glorifying the lord everyone glorifies the lord so sura sura archita that sura and asura they are all glorifying the lord so this is a positive describer so in this way these four characteristics of the spiritual world are being described in this verse and in the purport shri prabhupada elaborately talks about how the material world is insignificant just very small as compared to the spiritual world and there are so many universes and that here it's characterized by the six changes is temporary whereas that is eternal so i'll talk about this in three broad terms the nature of the spiritual world first i'll talk about relevance now why does it matter whether the spiritual world exists or not then second i'll talk about the rationale how can we logically rationally talk about the idea of a spiritual world is it just some religious fantasy and last i'll talk about its resplendence how it is so attractive so the first point is relevance now how how does it matter so basically every one of us we wish we all long for a better life in fact the hope that tomorrow can be better than today or today can be better than yesterday that is what inspires us to wake up every day to do things the hope that we can that they can be better that we can be better that we can help make things better it's that the longing for something better is innate within the human psyche and actually across the world 
if we consider the pre-scientific civilization. So before the pre-scientific age, in that time, whether we go to the east or the west or the Middle East or wherever, it's all. This is one common feature across all the major civilizations of the world that they had an understanding that beyond this world there is some other higher world, and that is the world to be attained. So, in the biblical tradition, for example, it is said that this world is like a bridge. Cross over it. Mm. And it, even if we consider traditions like Buddhism, where they don't necessarily talk about a personal divinity, but there also there's, there is a higher state of being. Now, it's almost like a state of non-being, and I'll talk about it, but it's considered to be better. At least we are free from the cravings, we are free from the distress. So the idea that there is a higher world, that we should all aspire for. That was common to everyone in the pre-scientific age. Now, how much people prioritize that, that's open to question. But the idea that there is a higher world and we need to go from this world to another world, it is, it is actually, it is cross-civilizational tenet that was accepted. Now, once the scientific age started, what happened was, they started thinking this idea of another world is just, it's just a religious mythology. And there is no such thing like that. So the idea was that instead of some kind of a religious paradise in another world, what science promised, science and especially more than science, it was technology, that they promised that this is, this is just wrong. So what we will do is science and technology will convert this world itself into paradise, into a technological paradise. And this particular idea is prominent even today. There is a whole school of thought called transhumanism. And this transhumanism, they hold that we human beings are inherently limited. We, we suffer from old age, we suffer from death, we suffer from sickness. And we want to go, we all have self-destructive drives. And they say, if you can re just rejig the biological programming of our body, and we can rewire the brains, then we can make humans live forever. We can free humans from self-destructive tendencies. Now, none of that has been actualized. But because technology has done so many things, people start believing that it's possible. So their idea is, this world itself will be made into paradise. And as the idea became that this world will become paradise, the idea of there being another world or that we should go to another world, that started becoming relegated to the background. So nobody cares for it in today's world. So that is a significant difference. That's why if, even if people today read, say, Shakespeare's writings or any of the writings of the authors below, before the scientific age, you know, the way people think doesn't really resonate. People seem to some some is quite resigned to fate, quite passive. It's because at one level they understood that the real aspirations are to be beyond this world. So we could talk about a four quadrant analysis. You know we can have. So Prabhupada talks about how this material world is also real. So we could say the material world and the spiritual world. So positive means, this means it's real, and this means it's unreal. Mm. So if we consider different schools of thought, they have different ideas about what is real and what is unreal. So let's start from the, where would materialism fall? The material world is real, but the spiritual world is unreal. So this is where materialism falls. And this is the prominent philosophy in today's world. And here from you can have other philosophy like scientism. Scientism is the idea, it's different from science. Science is method largely methodology. Scientism is ideology. That science alone has a monopoly on knowledge. That anything that science can't find doesn't exist. So this is the prominent philosophical worldview in today's world. That 
the material world is all that exists this is the one and only heaven and this is what we have to make into heaven if we can unfortunately instead of making it to heaven we start we are seeming to have made it into hell it's at least a physical level we can say a lot of things have improved as compared to at least recent historical memory you know starvation and poverty have decreased but at an internal level depression and stress and addiction and self destruction and suicide have all increased so the hope that this that the material world will itself be converted into a paradise that has not been actualized at all now when when people become skeptical yeah so there is no higher purpose to life there is no higher reality then, then now the material world and its own reality is quite disturbing is quite distressing so some people go to this extreme but neither this world is real nor the other world is real so this is nihilism and this is a very dangerous philosophy to be in there's no reality to at all existence at all even this world is false hmm? even this world is false when you start saying that then what happens is what is the point of living uh, there was a prominent existentialist philosopher alberto camo he, he read that existence is suffering and the more we try to remove the suffering the more it, the suffering increases therefore the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> that's what a gloomy view of the world now he wrote many books saying don't commit suicide today try to find something meaningful in life but the idea that this world is also meaningless this is, this is actually a terrible way to live mm. so materialism is bad but nihilism is worse and nihilism can make people extremely destructive you know that if oh my life is not happy why should anyone else's life be happy it, it is quite toxic now the idea that the spiritual world alone is real and the material world is false this is the idea of monism or specifically impersonalism mayavad mm. so in our philosophy we call it mayavad so mayavad is the idea that brahma satya jagan mithya that this world is completely false and many historians attribute this mayavad uh, to the cause of the downfall of india so india had one of the most prosperous and uh, formidable civilizations in the past but as mayavad started spreading and the idea became yeah if this whole world is false then who rules this world what happens in this world who cares for that and as people became more and more indifferent to the world now that indifference led to apathy and we may become apathetic about the world but others who think this world to be real they are not going to be apathetic they are going to be aggressive that's how aggressor after aggressor for almost a thousand years the indian subcontinent was uh, ruled by various aggressors so so this the idea of monism or mayavad can make us very mm, unhealthily indifferent to this world not just indifferent to the world but unhealthily indifferent mm. so it can make us irresponsible it can also breed a toxic kind of apathy so the idea this is if you consider the material world is real and the spiritual world is real this is the this is the this is the bhakti bhakti world view this is the bhakti idea this is we could call it as personalism that the material world is real and the spiritual world is real and this actually inspires a person to do both to act responsibly in the world and to also aspire for something bigger than this world when krishna says mam anusmara yudhyacha he is not just saying mam anusmara yudhyacha why fight because this world is also worth fighting for that krishna considers this world so important that he comes regularly to establish dharma in this world so with this world view what happens is like this 8.7 what i said mam anusmara yudhyacha the bhakti world view says that we function in two ways our primary is our connection with the lord 
that is important to do we want to connect with him through our heart's devotion but also because this world belongs to the lord we want to serve him in this world also and that is contribution so mam anusmara is connection we remember the lord and we our ultimate aim is to develop devotion to him so that we can attain him but that does not mean we don't care for this world we want to we want to make this world also harmonious with the purpose of the lord sometimes we as devotees might gravitate if we start with say here quadrant 1 2 3 4 we may also gravitate toward the third that oh this world the world is all temporary it's just a place of misery just get out of it well yes that is the ultimate purpose but the way to get out of it is not just by by just turning away in frustration for the world it is by responsibly doing our service in the world now suppose some guest comes to our house and they're feeling this they i'm feel they say i'm feeling very cold now will we tell them what to do prabhu the world is dukhalaya <laughs> the world is a place of distress <laughs> well i'll say i don't think the world is a place of distress your house is a place of distress <laughs> so the world may be a place of distress but we should not be when we are interacting with each other our focus should be what is my dharma what is my duty what am how can i serve krishna in this situation and as devotees our purpose is not just to make things better in the hope of converting this world into paradise that's not our purpose but our, we can make things better so that we can focus our mind on krishna better so if right now if this was not a closed place and we had cold wind blowing over here now we could still have this class but all of us would be extremely uncomfortable so trying to make this a comfortable place not for the sake of comfort but comfort so that there can be fo- better focus on krishna and that much endeavor is something which is required so that's why the bhakti philosophy is actually the holistic way of functioning in the world that there is connection with the lord so that we aspire for the spiritual world and there is contribution in the world we try to make this world harmonious with the spiritual world so now i don't think i'll be able to talk of all the points here what i was planning to talk but just quickly i'll make a couple of points so i've talked about the relevance why is it relevance this is the holistic most holistic way we can function in the world now the second part i mean is rational some people may say okay how do you know even the spiritual world exists prabhupad talks about this purport about the authority of the supreme law or the authority of the bhagavatam from the authority of the bhagavatam we can know the spiritual world but what about how do we explain to people who do not accept the authority of the world see the point is that everyone so we can make some inference we cannot have a conclusive uh, conclusive verdict but we can make some inference from it from from logic see this is say our daily world the physical world now what happens is if the physical world is not distressing at the very least generally it is boring <laughs> it's uh, no every day is humdrum you know we do our daily ablutions we go through our routines we go for our job it's not that every day is exciting it becomes boring and people seek some relief some break some escape away from it and now even those people who claim to be very scientific very rational they say oh there's no such thing as a spiritual world but all these people most of these people they cre- they try to lose themselves in some kind of imaginary world the imaginary world maybe through movies through novels through fiction so what happens is people create what you could call a virtual world hmm? and they try to escape to that world when say a new marvel universe movie is released or a new in the past there was harry potter when something would be released there would be like a mania people would just completely immerse themselves in it 
they will wear the kind of paraphernalia and they will try to get the things and go over there and they want to transport themselves to that world you tell them harry potter is not real who cares <laughs> you, know, you know i enjoy it you know, i enjoy it who cares whether it's real or not so the point is as soon as people start enjoying fiction they start they suspend their disbelief they suspend their rationality so what actually the physical world what we can call as the natural world it is limited and it is unsatisfying so people may be rational they say there's no such thing as mystical powers but you know everybody has the whole star wars has this force and it's mystical and people enjoy that what happens is that actually attraction to the supernatural is natural that there is something more than the daily world the natural world attraction to the supernatural is natural for human beings and because of that if there is not, nothing supernatural that our world view allows then we just suspend that world view and may call it fiction but we just lose ourselves in it so what what the what the bhagavatam's world view says is that yes actually this is a this is escape from reality if you consider the physical world to be reality what are people doing they are creating an alternative which they themselves acknowledge as fictional but they escape from it escape from the physical world to that world so what the bhagavatam says is why do we have this longing because there is a higher world and when we go toward that world that is not escape from reality that is escape to reality there is a higher reality and we escape escape this escaping is not escapism this escape is actually going from a constricted condition to a more free a more liberated condition so it's a reasonable inference that when we long for a better life and we are ready to lose ourselves in fiction then why not explore the idea that there might be a better life and there might be a better world beyond this world so this is what the great saints have talked about and these saints have been they are not just uh, like sentimental fans of some fictional characters many of the saints who have talked about the spiritual world are some of the greatest philosophers that the world has ever seen and they have used their philosophical intelligence to talk about the glory of the spiritual world so it's it's a reasonable reasonable possibility to at least explore and the key part of the spiritual world is the third part i'm going to talk about is the resplendence resplendence is its attractiveness so now there are multiple factors in this i'll quickly try to summarize what shri prabhupad mentions now prabhupad says there is no time in the spiritual world. na kal vikramah now the key point is that script statement in scripture have to be understood in context if we read books like govinda lilamrit or the bhajan paddhatis that are given in our gaudiya tradition you know in the traditional gaudiya way of meditation it's all about the timing it is about krishna in the morning from this time to this time perform this past time in the afternoon he performs this past time and the afternoon they are later after he performs this past times and the devotees in this world they meditate at those times on those past times which krishna is performing in the spiritual world so what does no time mean so no time essentially means no control by time time does not prabhupada mentions this purport that time does not deteriorate time does not destroy kalosmi lokakshay krut prabhu krishna says time i am the destroyer of the worlds so the what makes time so damaging is that time deteriorates and destroys things in the spiritual world there is cyclicity without any deterioration there is morning after you evening, evening so time actually aids krishna in his past times so time doesn't control krishna time assists krishna so what is present in the material world may also be present in the spiritual world but there it doesn't limit it doesn't control it doesn't destroy so that means no deterioration by time no destruction by time that is the key characteristic of time in the spiritual world 
and then similarly it is uh, 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 now prabhupada says that this spiritual world is is far bigger than this material world this is one fourth that is three fourth and now and he says that there is a viraja river in between and beyond that is the spiritual world now th now that is important to understand but at the same time it's important to understand also the spiritual world doesn't just exist at another place so if you consider say this is england and say this is something like ireland or scotland or whatever on top so it's like you just cross one one place and you go there the spiritual wo world is not like that the spiritual world is not just existing at another place it exists at another level of reality so it is not that somehow bhakti sanskar thakur say would say that you cannot get crash into the spiritual world <laughs> it is not that you just get a good enough boat or a good enough truck and you break through the doors and go in no, it exists at another level of reality so and then that uh, that means and this because it exists at another level of reality what it means is that that level of reality can be accessed even now while we are in this world and that brings us to the last characteristic that is sura sura archita everybody is glorifying the lord over there and so there is that well known verse that where the lord says na ham vasami vaikunthe yoginam hrudaye shuva yatra gayanti mad bhakta tatra tishthami narada so he says i doesn't reside in i don't reside in vaikuntha i don't reside in the hearts of my of the yogis i reside wherever the devotees are glorifying the lord and he would is glorifying me now what does it mean does it literally mean that if we go to the spiritual world we say that the it's the, there's it's vacant god is not there over there no, god is there in everybody's heart so why is he not there in the yogi's heart so the point which krishna is making here is that the lord is present in the spiritual world the lord is present in everyone's heart including the yogi's heart but he is not perceivable there for us we can't perceive the spiritual world we can't perceive what is in the yogi's heart but where there is glorification of the lord that is where we can feel his presence we come to a temple even even people who are non theistic they come to a sacred place like a temple they feel that some different vibes over here i don't know what it is but something is different and if we come and there's a there's a ebullient kirtan going on or there's a melodious sweet soft kirtan going on either way we find that there is some kind of sublime presence over here something extraordinary is there so we perceive the lord's presence where the lord is glorified and that means if we start glorifying the lord we start associating with devotees whose lives are dedicated to glorifying the lord then we can start perceiving his presence even in this world and in that sense we can experience the spiritual world here itself once the devotees were taking uh, shila prabhupad for a morning walk and they want to take him to a normally they would take him to a park but then somehow they it was a new place they messed up the directions wow. and they went to a place which was like quite dirty and uh, not at all attractive and they said sorry prabhupada we brought you here and this prabhupada said you know this is why kunta is really the devotee taking away prabhupada says you know he says you are a devotee and we are discussing krishna katha wherever you prabhupada so you humble he said not that i am a devotee he says you are a devotee this is wherever devotees discuss krishna katha that is why kunta so vaikuntha is not just a place that we will attain in the future it is a consciousness that we can attain even now as we dedicate our life more and more to the glorification of the lord we can experience the contentment the freedom from not time but the fear of the influence of time freedom from the we freedom from cravings created by the lower modes freedom from maya all that can be experienced if we devote ourselves to glorifying the lord sura sura archita ha what what the, the essence of the spiritual world is the mood of the glorification of the lord and when we cultivate that mood so the, the most glorious aspect of the spiritual world is that it is always accessible it is accessible to anyone who glorifies the lord and in that sense it is not that we have to after death go to the spiritual world even now we can immerse ourselves in the consciousness that characterizes the spiritual world by reorienting our life in every situation 
we ask ourselves, how can I serve Krishna? How can I glorify Krishna in this situation? And that is what Srila Prabhupada did. And that is what Srila Prabhupada has inspired and equipped all of us to also grow towards. So I'll summarize. I spoke three broad points today. First point I spoke about the relevance of the idea of the spiritual world. And then we talked about the relevance is that it is the most meaningful way to live. The connection in terms of the Lord, growth of the Lord, and growth in our relationship with the Lord, contribution in this world. We talked about four quadrants that materialism and modern modernity hold that only material world is real. But we are not being able to replace a religious paradise by a spiritual by a technological paradise. Physically, maybe things have improved, but psychologically things have worsened far more. The nihilism is nothing is real, and that's a very toxic way to live. The idea that monism, impersonalism, mayava, that only the spiritual world is real, that can make us, uh, again, harmfully apathetic. But when we understand this world is real and the other world is also real, spiritual world is real, then we can act most responsibly and resourcefully. And the, uh, the rationale was that we, may r that we all seek to seek some other world. And that's why we create fiction as an escape way. So, but fiction, we all know, is false. So instead of escaping from the physical reality to, to a virtual reality, why not be open to the possibility that there is an actual reality, and because there is an actual higher reality, that's why we are attracted to higher reality. So attraction to the supernatural is natural, because there is a natural supernatural reality. And then last part was, the resplendence is, that actually there is no time in the sense that, no deteriorating aspect of time, that there is... It is not geographically limited. It is at a particular place, but it is also accessible to us if we devote ourselves to glorifying the Lord. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. We are a little over time. Is there one question? Okay, oh, okay there are quite a few questions. Okay. Hare let Krishna. Me, let me know when to stop. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very nice class. Um, I just had a question based on the last point you mentioned in your class, uh, and I was just wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit more on that. Basically, um, so I'd say maybe for some of us, we might have uh, gratitude and appreciation actually for the material world because it gives, it gives us the opportunity to practice Krishna consciousness and build that connection. But then uh, I received some senior advice once that if we don't have a distaste and really want to get out of the material world, we can't build... Uh, attraction for the spiritual world and I was just wondering if you could expand a bit on that point if we um, or how we can practice okay. uh, and yeah, still be happy question. in the material so world. So do we need to have distaste for the material world to practice spiritual life? Well this is not a absolute principle. See bhakti is very much individual and dynamic so the broad principle is you know, in bhakti surrender means we accept the favorable and we avoid the unfavorable. So now, what will be unfavorable for whom, that can vary from person to person. So in the Bhagavad Gita itself, there are two broad attitudes to the material world. One is, as you said, that, how do we see the material world? It is a distressful place that we need to transcend. Hmm? Uh, but then other is, it is, all. this is in the, for example, 8th chapter, Krishna talks about this. But, this is also the abode of the Lord's vibhuti, his opulence, that everything attractive in this world manifests a spark of his splendor. That's in the 10th chapter. So the idea, key point is, are we remembering the Lord? So as you said, if we can remember the Lord in this world also, then that's wonderful. Uh, so the key point is that we want to develop our relationship with the Lord. So for some people, oh, this world being so filled with distress, that's what inspires them to develop the relationship with the Lord. For some other people, it may be that, yeah, this world has not been so bad for me, but my heart longs for something more. So I'm grateful for what I have, and I seek something more. So uh, I don't think we need to always focus on the fact that, uh, see, distress may inspire us to turn towards the Lord. But distress cannot sustain us. So we need a positive impetus for connecting with the Lord. So if it's only distress, then okay. Then it's like, is, is it really a loving relationship? Or is, or is it like a forced relationship? You know, it's like, 
you know, Krishna, I want to come to you. Why? Because everything else is miserable. Yeah, well, okay. That's not the, like if a boy proposes to a girl, please marry me. He says, why? Because no one else is ready to marry me. <laughs> you know, that's not the most flattering proposal. <laughs> so, generally we should have a positive impetus for turning towards the Lord. Okay, thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you for the class, Prabhu. Um, you were talking about time and how when it says there's no time in the spiritual world, that means we don't have control. As in there's no, no control. Not, we don't have control. control. Of time does not control. Time, yeah, time does not control. Us. And then also in the purport, uh, there is no past, present and future. Can you say something about that? Yeah, now this the idea of past, present and future, again, see there are many places in the spiritual world where in, 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 in our scripture, where the literal and the non-literal are just seamlessly brought together. So, for example, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that that which is night for all living beings is day for the enlightened. Now, that's clearly not literal. It's not that all enlightened people stay in one time zone and all <laughs> uh, ignorant people stay in another time zone. And that is just 12 hours apart, you know. <laughs> so, it's not like that. It's, it's referring to day is the domain of activity, the domain of knowledge, the domain of clarity, perception. Night is the absence of all that. It's just non-literal. So... Here, when we talk about past, present, and future in the material world, there is the idea that, uh, in the, for example, in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says that when we hear about the Lord, then what happens is, Yasyam vai shurumayamanayam krishne parama purushe bhakti rudbhati de pumsam shoka moha bhayapaha. When we hear about Krishna, then shoka moha and bha, bhaya go away. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that generally we have shoka, we have lamentation about the past. We have moha about the present. And we have bhaya about the future. We lament about the past, we have illusion. What will make my life better in the present? And we have fear, this may go wrong, that may go wrong. So when we say that there is no past, present, future, that simply means that, that actually all these negative emotions associated with the past, or the past was so terrible, or even the past was wonderful, it's all over now. There could be nostalgia which could also be negative. And the fear, we don't know what's going to happen, it's all filled with fear. So those negative emotions are absent. It's just like, it's an eternal present in the sense that, that it's like everybody is going to have, everybody is going to in one sense be the same and they're going to have loving relationship with everyone. So, is there a change? Is there a change in the sense that it's just new experiences are there, new pastimes are there, new reciprocations are there. But there is no, the negativity associated with the change that we call out past, present and future, that is nonetheless not there. There's a question here, okay. Quickly. The mic in you. Hi, Hare Krishna. Um, could you please explain what's the difference between the three modes of material nature and Maya? Okay, what is the difference between three modes and Maya? Well, Maya is daiviya esha gunamai mama maya adurutya. Krishna says, the maya, the illusory energy, is made of the three modes. So then the, we have to understand what does maya mean? The word can have many different meanings. The maya is the energy of the Lord that is the creator of illusion. Hmm? That is, it is maya who, puts, who, who creates the various illusions. Then maya can also refer to illusion itself. Hmm? that the illusion that is there in the world, that is also maya. Then maya can also refer to state of illusion. That means I am in maya or somebody is in maya. Hmm? So, the, so we said the world is not maya, that means the world is not illusion. But what is illusion is that, that the temporary appears to be eternal for us. The pleasure that is insignificant appears irresistible for us. There are three things over here. Maya can refer to the energy that creates illusion. It can refer to the illusion itself and it can refer to the state in which somebody has gone. So, this is Maya. Now, generally the modes are, you could say, the, the, the means by which illusion is created. So, Krishna, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita says that, uh, what is that? Purusha prakriti stohi bhungte prakriti jan gunan. Prakriti jan gunan. That the material world, the material energy is, the material world 
in the sense objects within it they are they are formed through the modes so we could say the modes are like the building blocks of material existence so if somebody is watching a tv and they are completely lost in the movie now at one level the movie is nothing but just three colors of pixels on a screen that's all there is but those three colors of three color pixels rgb or whatever rgb depending on which technology is used that is what all those three pixels the colors of pixels are combined together in such a fascinating uh, way that a person gets consumed by it. there are beautiful forms there are beautiful scenes there is action there is all those things that are there so the modes you could say like the three pixels the three pixels they can form so many different images like that if we consider three modes are the three color pixels that lead to lead to all the all the all the material objects in the world so we could say the modes are the resource the means by which maya creates illusion okay thank you last question yeah um at the beginning you were saying that the devotees and the serious um demons glorify Vishnu mm. in the spiritual world, and I've read that somewhere before as well. Is there any demons in the spiritual world? Well, yeah, it's a good question. Are there demons in the spiritual world? When Prabhupada was asked this question, he said there are no demons; there are only rumors of demons. <laughs> <laughs> what he means is that what he was ex explained at that time was that uh, the when Krishna starts doing mischief, the Shiva tells him, you know, this demon come will come and threaten you. He has to be like chill. Parent will bugaboo like that, you know. So there are rumors that there are demons. There are rumors. Even when Krishna goes out, when the, the demons, there's a rumor that demons are going to come. That creates anxiety. That creates greater absorption in Krishna. That flavors the pastime. So in that sense, we can say there are no demons over there. But there's another way of looking at it also that that there are there is a demoniac mentality, and there is there is a there is a form that is generally associated with demoniac. that means say for example that conventional idea of demons would be like some they have some horns coming out of their head and teeth coming out of their mouth and they are like ferocious looking so there are certain forms which are generally associated with the demoniac nature now we have the example in the bhagavatam rutrasur who had a demoniac form but he did not have a demoniac mentality he was even more devoted to the lord than indra himself so when it is said over here that the sura sura archita actually i was hoping somebody would ask that question i didn't till i already speak on this so good that you asked what it means is that there can be all kinds of living beings even those living beings whose bodily forms are associated with the demoniac demoniac nature but they do not have the demoniac nature the principle is everybody is glorifying the lord so even if there are living beings which are which are having a form that is generally associated with a demoniac nature but they don't ha they have that form but not that nature and that's how they are also glorifying the lord so the point over there is everyone is glorifying the lord that is the key point okay. thank you very much granthraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki hitai gaur premanande Hare Krishna if anyone is interested in Chaitanya Charan Prabhu's books he's written many books on the Bhagavad Gita and some calendars there's some books just outside the temple room so if you'd like to um, grab some please feel free Hare Krishna Thank you so much I'm sorry I, I had a question but you finished the class Oh so sorry I didn't quickly know, I didn't notice you had raised your hand Yeah I know oh. I just write at the end Okay sure um, the question is um could you explain briefly the mathematics of I don't think there's any mathematics to it. And it's indicative, I understand. Just like when you say, sorry, it's indicative. It's not literal. Mm.